Right hey guys, today we're talking about medieval arrowhead types. So many, so many from so many cultures. That's all coming up. So today we're looking at uh, early medieval arrowheads. That is really from, it's after the migration period, so we're really looking at post AD 600 through to around the middle of the 11th century, that is the 1050. These are my modern reproduction arrowheads. I didn't make them, I've just bought them commercially. They're not originals, obviously. Uh, so, alright, let's get into it. Uh, now this is the Type 3 broad head. Uh, now you can notice there's a barbed head on that and that's obviously going to create some very painful injuries once it goes inside you and it'll be difficult to get out. So these would be quite good for both hunting and also for uh, war. You see these really from the kind of towards the end of the classical period, that is the Roman sort of period, right through the whole medieval period. The next one we've got is a curved broadhead, that's the, um, the Type 14. And what's interesting about this one, uh, as you, again you can see, these would make, these are, uh, the way that that's shaped would make it very difficult to remove, and so if you were hit with this on the battlefield, it would be uh, an incredibly difficult proposition to get that removed from someone. And we can see uh, quite long, aspects to the arrow, quite a heavy arrow head as well, although I'm told uh, if these are um, properly forged by someone who really knows what they're doing, they can actually be made quite thin and therefore nowhere near as heavy as you might expect, and therefore you do get quite a good range and they'll fly quite straight and true. This is the Type 15, now, there's a lot of contention around this one. Uh, by some historians, it's quite interesting. Um, some historians debate their use at all. This is a very large warhead, as you can see. And if we compare that to my hand, there you can see that's um, a sizable piece of kit. Um, now there's a great deal of evidence for these being used in history not only in terms of archaeological finds, in the proximity of battlefields, but also uh, depicted both in text and also in, um, in portrayals in artwork. So iconography from the time, such as uh, the Battle of Pointiers, there are some very famous paintings with these. There's also depictions in the Morgan Bible and also on the Bayou Tapestry so what would this be used for? Well, in something like this you would use it deliberately to target the enemy horses. The Anglo-Saxons knew about uh, the Norman cavalry uh, and the Norman knights. Um, King Harold Godwinson had served with William the Conqueror, um, perhaps not quite so willingly as some people suggest. Essentially he was under house arrest at the time and forced to go on campaign. Um, but there we go, right go. So, uh, so something like this would take down, uh, if you like, an enemy horse or also very large game, such as elk. Potentially you could use that against bear as well. Once again, we can see these uh, incredible, sort of well designed, so that it would be very difficult to remove and would cause some very significant injuries once inside either a person or an animal. In terms of horses, um, if you can take down an enemy horse, 
the, the, the rider is going to come down and they're not going to be in, in such a great condition. A war horse of the early medieval period would still have weighed around 500 kilograms plus all the kit that goes on top of it, so saddlery and tack. You might have another 50 kilos there, plus, um, you know, combine that with the kinetic energy of the actual fall itself, and you'd find someone would really be struggling uh, once they were dehorsed. So there we go, guys. That's, that's broadheads. Now, what else have we got? So we have this very interesting Type 6 curved uh, arrowhead. Now, some people have described these as rope cutters. Uh, no, in short. Um, I don't think there's any evidence to say that these were used against rope uh, and, and ships rigging, that kind of thing. Potentially they could be, I suppose. I, I don't really sort of see how that could be uh, practical. You do have the advantage, though, of, of something like this because when it hits a target, it's going to swing around and cause, um, if you like, bigger injuries and so something like this would be quite useful against um, pheasant, quail, small game, um, particularly smaller types of deer would all be, um, be legitimate targets for something like that. So um, good options there. Fire arrows. <laughs> These are again a very well debated subject. Um, amongst the historical community you see a lot of people really talking them up and a lot of people talking them down as well in the early medieval period and particularly going back into the classical period um, it would be very easy and very sort of likely I guess for something like this to be used in conjunction with some cloth which had been soaked in pig's fat or linseed oil something like that which is essentially a fire accelerant and uh, definitely that would be able to carry would it be able to carry 150 meters or so the range of a bow at the time that's that's quite debatable uh, and i intend to do some testing on this a little bit later in the year i wasn't able to do testing last year because of um the, the catastrophic fires that we had throughout australia uh, but I do intend to do some testing this year. So what else uh, about these? Well, in the later medieval period, once the trade kind of empires uh, expanded further, then you start to see these being used with what is essentially black powder. Uh, you can find recipes for that online. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but um, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, I my particular interest really is is up to the 12th century so um if you want to go and use those that's you can go nuts all right um but definitely these could be used and there is archaeological evidence uh, that proves that they were used and in terms of being able to create fear and create panic amongst the local populace through harrying and through uh, causing fire and devastation into the local populace then this would be a great way to be able to do it and very effective. Rightio, the next ones we're going to have a look at are tanged warheads. These ones are made more famous I guess by the Anglo-Saxons. They certainly seem to have been used more so by the by the Saxons as opposed to the Vikings. Uh, but there is the archaeological evidence for these all throughout Europe. So it's very difficult I think to necessarily say that they're used more so by one culture than another. The advantage of these is that they're seated well back into the arrow shaft and you have a uh, uh, quite a, a solid projectile which will um, go in quite deep. These were apparently quite effective against armour. I'm going to do some testing on that myself later this year, that is 2020, and we'll see how we go definitely looking forward to that but you can see this tanged section in the warhead now I find that quite interesting because it does create it, it, it changes the center of gravity for the warhead these are really good reproductions I've got these from a company called medieval fight club 
and I, I really like this because they're so thin they're almost like you know razor thin type type arrow um, arrowheads and and you have this um this really sort of great reproduction so very much looking forward to getting some arrows made up and doing some testing with those what's interesting about the um the tanged warheads is they actually go back a long way in history we know these go right back to the stone age uh, and there's lots and lots and lots of evidence for that so they've been used right throughout and right into the medieval period in fact there's evidence for them being used as late as the 14th century so really really interesting there and I guess people simply did that because that's how it's always been done or maybe in their particular community or their particular family that was how it was always done and the tanged arrowheads give a very interesting contrast to socketed warheads now we have a couple of different um, bodkins here. Bodkins have been used right from the classical period. So that is um, from the Roman period throughout. And again, these are designed as an armor piercing warhead, not really for hunting. I suppose you could hunt with them, but um, the damage this arrow would do to, if you like, uh, clean skin or, or just a, a non-armored opponent would be actually significantly less. A couple of very interesting points about bodkins, uh, they come in two styles, one is circular, one is square. Now circular bodkins really seem to have been around a lot longer and that's because they are used really to defeat cloth armour. So things like um, your padded armour, your gambesins, um, akatins, padded jackets, uh, that kind of thing. And, and certainly they go back right into the classical period. These are socketed warheads as you might be able to see so in other words the arrow shaft goes up into the warhead like so now these square bod bodkins are interesting because what they're designed to do is defeat chainmail so now what the way that works is the the square so the arrow would penetrate into the circle and because the force is projected onto the then what happens is that force is um, basically used and it will break a, uh, a circular piece of metal and so these became very effective and we don't unfortunately know a whole lot about medieval bow types and the strength of those bows um, there are finds obviously uh, which go back into the viking period but also um, more so from things like the mary rose the mary rose really being outside of the medieval period what I think is interesting, of course, is that bows would have developed both in uh, technology and also in style. So throughout the period, uh, you, you start to see what we at least believe would be stronger and stronger bows. So in the earlier periods, you would probably see bows with a, a draw strength of maybe sort of 40 pound, 50 pound. I think would be quite realistic maybe as much as 60 pound and certainly by the um, 700 800 60 pound would probably become the norm and then when we get into um, the, the the post Norman invasion period you start to see I would believe bows that would be above 80 pound now we'd have no evidence to support that unfortunately but we have to go through descriptions and there are some very interesting descriptions about particular archers and their skill and the um the way that their bows were used and we obviously in order to defeat armor you have to have bows which are a particular sort of strength righty guys thank you so much for watching please like subscribe and share i'll catch you in my next video